The International Association for Near-Death Studies presents NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. What happens when a nine-year-old boy who hopes to be a priest someday happens to have a profound near-death experience? How does a direct experience of God get in the way of religion's preconceived notions of good and evil? Welcome to NDE Radio, brought to you by IANS, the International Association for Near-Death Studies. I'm your host, Lee Whitting. Raymond Kinman is a woodcarver, musician, and artist who had a near-death experience when he was nine years old. He writes that, It wasn't until my 50s through IANS when I was able to come out of the NDE closet that I was able to integrate my experience, and I'm now living an extraordinary life. Raymond was for 23 years a woodcarver for Walt Disney Company and has done a series of paintings about his NDE. He has been featured on the biography channels I Survived, Beyond, and Back series, which you can see at his website, lovingiswhy.com. Raymond, welcome to NDE Radio. Thank you for having me, Lee. That's, that's Good morning. Good morning. It's much earlier in California than it is here in Maine. That's true. <laughs> Raymond, I wonder if you could uh, tell our audience about your near-death experience. Sure, I can do that. That's uh, my contribution to humanity. Sure. Mm. Well, as you mentioned, I was nine years old. Uh, people kind of know what how this happened. Uh, it was... Uh, after school one day, I was going to Catholic school, and as you mentioned uh, before, I was a very devout, devout Catholic, and I, at the time, I thought I was going to be a priest. And I was walking down the sidewalk after school, down toward uh, where we do our carpooling, and um, my friend Peter mentioned that he was taking judo lessons, and uh of course, that was fascinating to me, and I thought, very cool. And so mm -hmm. he's, he said that he had learned how to, um, how to take his opponent and roll him over his shoulder and lie them prone on, on the ground. And I thought, well, show me. And I wanted to learn, right? But Peter really, he didn't know what he was doing. And he took me and rolled me over his shoulder, but I went head first onto the concrete on his uh, and uh, I'll tell you what, at that time, I thought pain was getting soap in my eyes in the bathtub. But <laughs> this was something different. This was something different. It was an explosion. And um, I took a really hard hit to the head. And mm. uh, I... Uh, running toward the nurse's office. Remember the nurse's office? I don't think they have them anymore at school. But well, I, I do we, remember them, though. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> so I started running. I know it was, it was hurt badly. Yeah, and I started running that way. And then I lost consciousness, I, and I fell face first on the, on the asphalt. Uh, what happened was, no, I was, uh, I, I was not conscious for this part, but Apparently, my body went into convulsions, and my tongue buckled back into my airway, and I, I, I couldn't breathe. Mm. So I suffocated. Now, when I say I lost consciousness, it wasn't like going to sleep and waking up. It was, there was no break in my awareness. I was here, and then I was not. I was not here at all. And I can only describe the first part as a void. And there was, uh, there was no darkness, no lightness, no sensations, no, no gravity. It was nothing. And I, and, but I could still reason. I was still me, 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 me. And, mm -hmm. um, um, I started getting scared. I was afraid. I couldn't figure out 
what was going on, but I was trying to. And uh, the fear started ramping up. And I finally came to the conclusion that... Now, I remember, I didn't remember the accident. I couldn't remember that. But I finally figured out that I had lost my mind, that I had gone crazy. Hmm. And, and when I figured that out, I thought, well, if I'm going crazy, there's nothing I can do about it. And I just released, I let go. Mm-hmm. And when I let go, the pleasurable sensations began. Starting with, with like peace and contentment. And, uh, and then that started amplifying and ramping up into utter bliss. It was so beautiful. And what and, did you uh, see? Well, yeah, uh, I'm going to have to leave some details out because we're limited on time here. So sure. So kind of just give you some head, headlines. Uh, I became aware of a, a, a point of light, intense, brilliant, a trillion times brighter than the sun, white light. And somehow I knew I had to go there. I don't know how I knew that. Um but and maybe some of the listeners have heard uh, tales about traveling through a tunnel or floating above your body. Uh, that, those, that didn't happen to me. But I somehow that white light kind of sucked me into it, and it was living, breathing. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Okay, so I got pulled into the light, and um, I'll leave some details out here. Uh, I met my dog, Skippy. I remember I didn't remember the accident. There was no past. I couldn't mm-hmm. remember an accident or anything. But I met my dog, Skippy, who had died a couple years before, and uh, he... 
Uh, now, he didn't have it, you know, fur and legs and stuff, but it was skippy. And we mm-hmm. were communicating. And and he kind of absorbed me, and I absorbed him, and we were communicating. And the communication there was perfect, perfect communication. It was, it was uh, um, the, the, without words, so there was no confusion. But it was all about love. You know, Skippy, what are you doing here? Where are we? How, how, what's happening? You know, and he was communicating with me, too. Hmm, that's and, great. And, yeah, it was beautiful. It was so beautiful. <laughs> I was just so happy to see him. Um, another headline would be, I saw these... Now, everything was made out of light. It's about the best I can put it. And there was no stuff mm-hmm. there. Right? I saw these columns, like these golden columns, um, like you, you can maybe picture Roman columns with Parthenon or something like that, right? Yeah, they were yes. huge. And they went up like Jack and the Beanstalk. And it felt like it was, they were arranged in such a way that it felt like it was an entrance to something. But I didn't go there, so I don't know what that was. I, really, there's a lot I don't know. Um, the next headline would be that I was greeted by some sort of spirit uh, or entity. I don't know what what this being was, but it was intelligent like me, and he knew me. It was a masculine presence, by the way. I can't explain that. I don't know what that means. And he called me. And said, Raymond, come here. I want to show you some things. And he absorbed me, like Skippy did. And, but, and we we fell in love with one another. The most intense. You know, I've tried to think of adjectives to describe the love there. And nothing really works. You know, unconditional knowledge. The only one that works is infinite. It mm. was infinite love. And it permeated wave after wave after wave of cleansing love washing over me. And he, he, when he said, I want to show you some things, I, I had this download. I, I can only call it a download. It was like billions of questions were, were answered in, in just a moment. And all of creation opened up and kind of shimmered and, and, and I understood. And the odd thing was that I it wasn't like learning anything. I already knew it. It was more like remembering something. Not really, but kind of like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was... I. It was beautiful. He then showed me how utterly critical my purpose was. Uh, And when I speak about my purpose, I'm not really, it's not me, it's it's the listener. It's you. Mm -hmm. There is no way, Lee, creation could possibly unfold without you fulfilling your purpose. I know a lot of people struggle with that. What's my purpose? Because we all have our stupid jobs and our stupid bosses and we go home and watch TV and think, come on, there's got to be something more than this. Right. But he showed me what my purpose was. And this is kind of frustrating for me, Lee, because I've heard teacher after guru after priest after minister say that the reason we're here is either for a test or to learn and grow, learn lessons and grow and move to the next level. But that's not what 
that wasn't it. But there was n- nowhere to grow to there. There was no lessons to learn. There was nothing like that. Uh, and, and I was told what my purpose was and what your purpose is. And it sounds kind of simple, but it's not. It's a very complex and multidimensional thing. Um, listener, your your purpose is to love. That's it. And love is not just the warm fuzzies. Love expresses itself in so many different ways. As a matter of fact, it was very clear there that this stuff, the world that we live in, like rocks and almost everything is made out of love. You are made out of love. It was so clear there. And, you know, sometimes when I travel around the country and I speak, when I get to this point where I tell people what your purpose is, is to love, boom, the lights go on. You know, I see the light bulbs above people's heads. Oh, Mm. that's right. (laughs) (laughs) So, so, you know, the idea of learning and growing and all that seems to make sense on the surface because we, we do mature as we grow older. But it wasn't like that there. There was no place to grow to. And, and if uh, all if all of our questions are answered on the other side, then what is it more that we have to learn? Exactly. So I think you're I think you're right on target with that. You got it, Lee. You got it. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess the last part would be he being that I had to download with. And I, I can only remember a few things from that download. But um, he said, uh, you know, I want to introduce you to to my creator, my, to God. And if you don't like the word God, use something else. But it wasn't the dude with the big white beard and the lightning bolts. Mm. And, um, it, and it, it opened it went a step deeper. And uh, here's what, kind of what God looked like, if you can imagine this. <laughs> the best I can do. I've never been able to paint this this one, but uh, not yet, anyway. Hmm. Imagine that you are the Hubble t- Space Telescope, and, and you're floating sphere of awareness. So this is sur- surrounding you on all levels. And you're the Hubble Space Telescope, and you're looking at a galaxy. And galaxies are made up of little tiny stars, all little tiny points of light. And all of them together create this tremendous glow of light. Um, and each one of... I was one of those points of light. And each one of those points of light was... Every single snail or head of cabbage or kitty fly or human being who had ever lived, each one of them was one of these points of light. And there was no higher or lower. There was no higher beings or lower beings or anything. And and we were all connected. It was like I was still me. But I wasn't. I was also we. And we were singing. Uh, I can call it music, but it was much deeper than that. It was worship. It was, uh, it was, uh, it was love. It was, I love you. And it was this music that, that makes music as we understand it now. It's this pale in comparison because it, I have to taste it and breathe it and digest it, have sex with it. And it was, it was <laughs> complete. It was so cool. And we were worshiping one another. It was so beautiful because we were all one. So I was still Raymond, 
but I was God, too, at the same time. And that's hard to explain. I wasn't God, but I was. And mm. um, then uh, I was told I had, to, I had to go back. It was not my time. I had to go back. And then I didn't even know what back was. I didn't know what was happening. But I knew back meant something other than what was happening there. <laughs> <laughs> I just... I, I, through a spiritual temper tantrum, and I said, no, I'm not going to go back, no. And then, once again, it's not your time. You've probably heard that line before, it's not your time, you have to go back. Well, it wasn't in I words. I certainly have. That's, yeah. It wasn't words, but that, that's what it was. It's not your time, you have to go back. And I was sent back to my body. And... Uh, Getting stuff back into my body was not a pleasant experience. It was gross. And I was racked with pain. And I remember opening my eyes and seeing the paramedics circled above me. My head was packed in ice. And uh, I, I remembered what happened. And I closed my eyes. I tried to go back. Uh, no. <laughs> closed my eyes. It's so kind of funny when I think about it now. I tried to go back. <laughs> and uh, I heard one of the medical team say, he opens his eyes, opens his eyes, and he starts slapping me in the face. Raymond, wake up. Don't go to sleep. Don't go to sleep. You know, and uh, then there's a bunch of medical stuff that happened. But um, um, did, when I was, did you tell, I was go going to say, did you tell it? Did you tell anyone about your experience? I did. Um, when I was in the hospital, my mom came. And, and uh, she happened to be the director of nursing at the hospital that I went to. Mm. So I told her what happened. And she just, she was also a very devout Catholic. And she said, well, of course, honey, you took a hard blow to the head and the brain can do some funny things when, you know, you have an injury like that. And I was going, no, mom, this was real. And she was really concerned about it because she believed me. But mm. back then, this is 1966, your death experience wasn't part of our national conversation like it is now. And so she just assured me that she would set up a meeting with the parish priest, my mentor, Father Gallagher, and um, we'd work through it. And I can imagine we also, you know, I, I didn't have the power of language that I have now. I was nine years old. I must have found it like a fairy tale. Mm. But when I met with the priest, he told me that, um, that his, he used his best training, I think. Um, I don't think he did a bad job. Uh, but he, his, his take on it was that since I couldn't say that I had seen Jesus, I could I. I couldn't say that Jesus was there. It had probably been a trick of Satan. Oh. And uh, it scared me badly. I, uh, I stuffed it. I mm. didn't process it. I put it away psychologically. and um, I learned not to talk about it. And that's oh. only changed recently. You're, I take it, no longer a Catholic. Do you Although feel I that to, uh, I like to go to mass sometimes because his, his rituals are kind of cool? No, I don't. I'm not a Catholic. <laughs> no, I I understand. I um I was raised Catholic myself. I and there is a there is a beauty to the mass that um, is undeniable. But this seems to have very little to do with spiritual reality. It's very symbolic, I think. I, mean, I don't know what the symbolism is, but there's it's kind of cool. Yeah. Now what? In one of your other interviews, you said, uh, we are manifesting God wanting to play. Could you explain that? <laughs> well, that's a deep one. Sure. I'll do the best <laughs> I can. Okay. The, the best way I could put this is, this was part of the download, by the way. Um, when, Lee, when you go to the movies, you don't want to know coming up. You, you want to be surprised. You, as a matter of fact, you want to be scared, right? Mm -hmm. You want 
there to be bad guys. And so it's difficult. I don't want this to sound like I'm condoning violence or anything like that. I'm not. This is hard for me to, to, to understand, too. But everything here is an expression of love. And, and it gets kind of ugly sometimes. It can. Mm. But it's part, we're all an expression of love. Everything is. And so, why are we here? Well, we're, because you are God, and you, are, you want to come play. You're going to the movies. Mm. That's the best I can do. Paul, uh, St. Paul said that we are already in the heavenlies, and that image has always conjured up for me the fact that uh, we're sitting up there perhaps manifesting our own bodies like avatars in a video game, going through these uh, adventures that we go through, and uh, perhaps it is all for, for our amusement. That was really put beautifully. Thank you. <laughs> is it okay if I steal that line? <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> Anytime. Uh, th- th- no doubt this has changed your life. I mean, you're doing art of um, paintings about your near-death experience, and uh, you're playing music, which... Do, do you feel that um, your whole career was uh, evolved as a result of, of, of your NDE? No, I've always been a professional artist and musician. Um you know, my, my career, what changed was my life. I was living a fake life. Inauthentic is probably a good word. Uh, all I can say is that, uh, you know, now I look back on it and I think, oh, how sad. How sad. I was trying to be a Christian, but I was fake. I was faking it. And, uh, I didn't believe that stuff. I, you know, I'd go to church and everyone had their halos on, and I tried to put my halo on, but it didn't fit. <laughs> so I had to get honest, and um, it it wasn't easy. Mm. Uh, you know, I had a 34 year marriage that dissolved because of that. After you started talking about your NDE? Yes. After I yeah. came out of the closet and said, I can't do this. Mm. And, and, and with my marriage, she and I still love each other deeply. It's, there's no anger there or anything. It's not like that. Mm. It's just, it became impossible to fake it for me, yeah. spiritually. Raymond, we're just about out of time, unfortunately. Um, perhaps you could tell uh, the audience how they could uh, get in touch with you. I know you have a website. Yeah, that's the best way. You know, go to my website. It's uh, loving is why. Loving is why, as in this is your purpose. Loving is why. dot com. That's the best place. Okay, and I I should. In fairness, mention that there are a couple of really excellent interviews with you uh, that were done through uh, KMVT. Uh, so if they want to actually see you live <laughs> in uh, on TV, that that would I would highly recommend that they um, uh, look at both of those interviews. I thought they were excellent. Yeah, there's the biography channel thing on my website as well, which is this. It's uh, more dramatic. It's about 11 yeah. minutes long, and they spent half of it on the drama of the accident. But they did a good job. I mean, that's just yes, TV. they do, <laughs> and and they've done a lot to promote it. Uh, Raymond, we're out of time for today. I want to thank it's you been for a um, thank you, thank you. This has been great. Uh, thanks for taking time from um, from uh, your busy life to uh, to be with us on um, NDE Radio. And uh, to the listeners, if you'd like to listen to this show again or any other of our programs, please visit our website at nderadio.org. And for more information about IANS, please check that website at IANS, I-A-N-D-S dot org. 
There'll be information on that site about our upcoming Labor Day weekend conference on NDEs, health, and healing. And that's taking place in Newport Beach, California from August 28th through the 31st. I look forward to seeing you there. Thanks for listening.